23. Please open your Bible to Acts 23. My mistake, I had given a different scripture reading earlier, so Bob, Bob found out in the moment that we were reading that text instead. And I love that section. It's one of the first songs in our Bible, and it's after God strikes the Egyptians with the Red Sea crashing over them and the, the song of Moses there celebrating, really, the striking of God. Today's sermon I've entitled, When God Strikes, because we're going to hear the Apostle Paul declare a word of warning, condemnation, really of prophecy, I believe, against the high priest as he's on trial before the Sanhedrin. He says, God is going to strike you after he is struck in the face by a fist after the high priest um, told them to hit him. And so in this text, though, we're going to be looking at Paul's second trial this morning before the Sanhedrin, just like Jesus was on trial before the Sanhedrin. That's that Jewish court. That's the supreme court, if you will, of, of the land. Uh, it would be the equivalent of our supreme court, the highest court in all of Israel, the highest ecclesiastical court. He is on trial here. He's being brought before this court because he was just about to be interrogated by the Romans through an enhanced form of interrogation. Um, then they found out he was a Roman citizen and realized they were not allowed to flog him uncondemned. And so in today's text, we're going to Look at chapter 22, verse 30, and go through this all the way to verse 11, where the tribune, that's the Roman tribune, says, let me try another angle. Rather than me extracting the information, let me put him before his own people and listen in before a court trial to see if I can learn what is going on here. And so this is uh, where we find the Apostle Paul this morning in Jerusalem before the Sanhedrin, just like his Lord. So follow along, chapter 23, verse 30, and then I'll be reading just to verse 3 of chapter 23 and pray for us. Verse 30 of chapter 22. But on the next day, that's the day after Paul was about to be flogged and that didn't happen, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he, he is referring to the tribune there, that's Claudius Lysias, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet. The council is referring to the Sanhedrin. This is about 71 judges. They're quite a packed court, aren't they? <laughs> and he brought Paul down to set him before them. Verse 1. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. And Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. When God strikes, let's pray. Well, Father, as we open your word, we pray, God, that you would strike our hearts. We thank you, God, that you are a God who reveals himself not only in our hearts and our mind, but in real time and real history through real strikes. <laughs> Lord, will you show up and move powerfully in the world and in our lives, both to destroy evil and overcome it, but also for great good. And so, God, we thank you that you are a God who strikes. And as we look at this text this morning, we pray that we would see your activity and give you glory, and that even more, God, your spirit would be active through this text to strike us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. July 2nd, 1505, a lightning and thunderbolt struck from heaven and changed the world. There was a man who was studying to be a lawyer. His name was Martin Luther. He was caught in a thunderstorm and on his way in journeying was so frightened as the thunder and lightning bolt nearly hit him. He clung onto a rock and he made a vow. He said, help me, help me, Saint Anne, and I will become a monk. Martin Luther survived that ordeal and made good on that vow. He gave away his books of law and traded in his hat to join the monastery and study the Bible. And the world has never been the same. Martin Luther was a slave to fear, 
If you know German, forgive me, but I'm going to butcher this word. My ancestry is German. But is this deep-seated fear, this uh, spiritual struggle, this soul anxiety that gripped Martin Luther's life. And by the way, initially that thunderbolt was not something that unhinged him from it. We'll discover more of his story at the end. But this is the one who ultimately went into the church and launched a reformation. That got us back to God and His work, back to God and His word. But it began with a strike from heaven, where He was nearly cast down. If you read through your Bibles, just like the Song of Moses, we worship a God who strikes. We worship a God through the ten plagues that struck the firstborn son in Egypt, and in the Book of Acts earlier, we saw King Herod as. All the people were worshiping him, and he was wearing that sparkly coat of colors, and it was reflecting in the light. Ron preached so effectively, and people cried out, the voice of a God and not a man. And we are told, and God struck him. Right in that moment, he died eaten by worms. The God who strikes. Well, here in our text this morning, Paul is literally struck in the face, ordered by the high priest, and he quips back with a prophecy, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. And I want to take that language and that theme of striking to look throughout this entire passage, both in judgment text, but also in God's comfort. When God shows up, when God strikes, how it changes the world. So if you're taking notes, three ways the strike of God changes the world. The first way the strike of God changes the world is when God strikes, he brings down walls. When God strikes, he brings down walls. We'll read verse 1 again through the prophecy all the way to verse 5. And looking intently again at the council, that's the Sanhedrin, Paul said, Brothers, I've lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. The high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. And Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler. Of your people. It's interesting in this first section where Paul calls out and says, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. And then all of a sudden says, I didn't know who I was talking to. <laughs> Commentators have scratched their head at this moment and said, He speaks a word of judgment that God is going to take down this wall. And we'll unpack that in a minute. Why is he calling them a wall? What are, what's going on here? And he doesn't even know who he's talking to, evidently, right? I think John Stott is right in his commentary. Uh, people wrestle with how could he speak a word of judgment against the high priest and then say, I didn't know who I was talking to. Church history records that Paul had pretty poor eyesight. <laughs> and so it's probably very likely that Paul's before this court, cannot see who said the order there, and heard somebody say, strike him. And then all of us said, God's going to strike you. And they said, that's the high priest. Whoops. <laughs> But Paul spoke better than he knew, and sometimes in prophecies, and I believe that this is a Holy Spirit moment, and sometimes even unbelievers prophesy in your Bible. Did you know that? Earlier when Jesus was going before the trial of the Sanhedrin and others, the former high priest, that was Annas, not Ananias, not a different high priest, said it's better for one man to die for the nation than for all of us to die. And then there's a commentary by John, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He spoke better than he knew. Being high priest, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. Not only for the nation, but for the sheep of God scattered abroad. And so sometimes when we speak, we don't realize how good we are speaking. Well, Paul speaks a word of judgment against the high priest of the Sanhedrin. And he says, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. God is a God, when he strikes, he brings down walls. Now, why whitewashed wall? 
Good question. You should ask questions of your Bible. Well, out of all the phrases in the world, Paul, you chose white washed wool? Not the first thing I would think about to call somebody. So I did the, did the dive this week. You're welcome. Ezekiel chapter 13, the prophet Ezekiel talks about the leaders of Israel. And he charges them and calls them these white washed walls. Because as you know, a wall exists not only around a building, but like in ancient times and cities, walls were critical. Any major city had a big wall around it for protection. And if that wall came crumbling down, that city was exposed. And Israel's leaders were called to be protection for their people, this wall. But the prophet Ezekiel says that your, your words of over God's people of comfort and peace is wrong. You are not the proper wall. It's this imagery of these crumbling walls that are falling down. But we're not going to fix the walls. We're just going to whitewash over them. Just put a little plaster over there and it looks pretty good. It looks like that wall's going to stand. But that whitewash wall is not going to stand. That whitewash wall will protect no one. That whitewash wall is coming down. The idea of being whitewashed in your Bibles is this idea of it's not what it appears to be. You know, Job's friends, when Job was suffering miserably, he had those three friends who came to comfort him, right, and tell him what God was doing in the world and in Job's life at that moment. Those miserable comforters. He calls them worthless physicians. Listen to this. Job quips back. He says, you whitewash with lies. He's saying, you're covering over my whole circumstance, and it looks good. Everything you're saying is so eloquent, but you're whitewashing with lies. And Jesus, when he went hard after the Pharisees and the scribes, he used this imagery. He said, you guys are a bunch of whitewashed tombs. You look so pretty on the outside, so clean, but you are full of death, decay, dead bones, and uncleanness. How you appear on the outside is not who you really are in the inside. You are whitewashed tombs. So when Paul says, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall, all that imagery, especially Ezekiel, should be filling your mind saying that wall is coming down. When God strikes, he brings down walls. The hypocrisy of the high priest here is startling. Now, sadly, the hypocrisy of most of the clergy in our New Testament is jarring. And, of course, this is the same court that Jesus stood trial on before he was passed off to Pontius Pilate. Now, it's many years later, and just like our courts, there's a changeover of who's sitting on the court, including the high priest. And yet the injustice of the court is preserved and its corruption is preserved. And we get a snapshot into that corruption. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian referring to this high priest, Ananias, said the following, he was a great hoarder of money. He even took away the tithes that belonged to the priests by violence. Now that's not a Christian. Josephus was just a Jewish historian commenting on the nature of this high priest. Now remember, Paul doesn't even know who he's talking to or about but he spoke far better than he knew. As Ron already said earlier, we're reading through the Old Covenant, the Old Testament right now, and the priesthood is ever before us. And we see the high priesthood, so the priests are the Levites, right, from the tribe of Levi, but the high priests come from Aaron's descendants, the Aaronic priesthood. So Moses and Aaron, his sons, they get the high priesthood, and they get the special vestments, and they get to wear the 12 jewels on the chest representing the 12 tribes of Israel with the names engraved on there. All this beautiful imagery. And I can imagine that this guy, while the court is appearing, is decked out in the greatest clergy vestments that you could imagine. He looks the parts as he tells him to strike 
this innocent man. And as all the other clergy know, this guy is a crook. (laughs) He's already rich. He's already got the most powerful position in the entire church, if you will. And yet he's stealing from the tithes to put more money into his own pockets. A white washed wall. And Paul speaks these words to a man he didn't even know that God is going to bring him down. And that is the God that we worship, a God who brings down walls. As I was thinking of that wall imagery, I couldn't help but think of the walls of Jericho. You remember this famous story where there is great evil and corruption in this ancient city and the people of Israel are supposed to come and enter into the promised land except there is a huge wall standing between them and the promises of God. And God does not say go and chisel down the walls. He doesn't say go and take a battering, batter it down. He says, just walk around the wall and worship me. And as they obeyed God and walked around and at the final circling around the wall, they screamed out with a loud voice, "Ah!" and the walls just came down on their own. And here we see as Paul declares this, this is not what he does. He doesn't say, you're going to hit me? I hit you. He turns the other cheek, does he? He's actually very cordial. He's like, I shouldn't have said that. Glad I did. Shouldn't have. (laughs) But God is going to bring down this wall. And as we've already talked about, this whole high priesthood in 12 years will be gone. And by the way, in reality, spiritually speaking, it's already gone. There is already a new high priest who has been installed in the throne room of grace. And his name is not Ananias. Amen? Jesus Christ is both the sacrifice and the priest. And we are told in the book of Hebrews, when he ascended to heaven, he became your great high priest. That high priest, that wall is coming down. Not because you don't need a high priest, but because you have a better one, one who will never die, who is never corrupt. Jesus is exactly who he appears to be, even better the more you get to know him. And so as Paul speaks this words of condemnation and judgment over the high priesthood, our eyes as believers go to a priesthood that will never fail us, our greatest high priest. Jesus Christ. That's the first way we see the strike of God change the world. First, when God strikes, he brings down walls. Secondly, when God strikes, he divides and delivers. He divides and delivers. Verses 6 to 10. Now, when Paul perceived that one part, referring to the court, were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. When he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the assembly was, listen to this, divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledge them all. That a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. When God strikes, he divides and delivers. Now, I love this scene in the courtroom. Sometimes God strikes, right, just like the walls of Jericho. You don't do anything, and all of a sudden those walls come down. But there are other times when the strike of God comes through human agency. I think of David and Goliath, where David was one that struck down lions and bears in the wilderness. And then before Goliath, you could say, well, who struck down Goliath? 
Who divided the Philistines? Well, humanly speaking, yeah, David. But we all know. We all know as that stone hit him right in the forehead and scattered and divided the army of the Philistines that God brought the deliverance. Now remember, this is the same court that Jesus stood before and they were completely united. You couldn't get between them as they passed him off to the Roman officials to be crucified. But Paul in this moment sees a chink in their armor and he knows just how to exploit it. Verse 6, he perceives the difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Why? Well, he was a Pharisee. In fact, he doesn't say, I was a Pharisee. He says, I am a Pharisee. Now, it's interesting because Jesus spoke harsh words against the Pharisees. Often, the Pharisees and the scribes. But I'll tell you what, he was not correcting their theology. He wasn't like, you Pharisees believe in a resurrection and spirits and angels. Go back and read your Bibles and Moses, right? Like, he does not say that. He says, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You put a weightiness and a man-made rules above your Bibles and restrict others and then you don't do anything to live it yourself. It was their hypocrisy that Jesus condemned. It was not their theology. Not their theology. Now, I don't want to geek out too much on theology, but you need to understand this about the Pharisees and the scribes to see why this worked. These are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were essentially the, the high priest uh, party. They were an aristocratic, wealthy bunch of people. They played well with Rome, partly because they liked power. Rome had the power. That works, right? And so, and they got to control, as the high priestly family, you know, the temple and all of the, the top things in Jerusalem. So they were very preoccupied with money and with power, and they held on to the books of Moses. But almost all of the supernatural stuff in there, they, they held, they were legalists. They held to the moral law, and they were quick to kill you if you broke the moral law. But when it came to angels and stuff, they didn't believe in that. They didn't believe in the soul or the fact that you could exist without a body or any of that, which is Interesting, because they accepted the five books of Moses. I'm just thinking, like, well, what did they do? And, like, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, and a big angel is guarding the way back to the tree of life. Like, I don't know. You know why? Because they don't exist anymore. <laughs> there are no more Sadducees. In 12 years, that high priestly family is over. The Judaism in a rabbinic form that still exists today is not the temple Judaism, because there's no more sacrifices is pretty much the great-grandchild of the Pharisaic tradition. Because they not only accepted the Torah and the prophets, but an oral tradition that then got preserved and continues in rabbinic Judaism. So they believe in the resurrection, just like Jesus and Paul. They believe in the soul, just like Jesus and Paul. They believe in spirit, just like Jesus and Paul. And by the way, just like your whole Bible teaches, right? They believe their Bible and all of these other things in the Bible that are more supernatural. And so Paul leverages that and he says, I am a Pharisee and the reason I'm on trial right now is because I believe in the resurrection and spirits and angels. And all of a sudden the Pharisee group stands in his defense. <laughs> what if an angel spoke to him? Whoa, slow down this court. Because if we kill him, we're basically saying that our theology is wrong and they're right. We will not have a court trial. You know, there will be no outcome of this trial that vindicates the Sadducees. All right? And so in that moment, the court parts. And Paul walks right through into safety and is delivered out of that trial. Once again, I think of the Old Testament where the people of Israel are standing backed up against the Red Sea and the Egyptians and Pharaoh are hunting them down, chasing them down. And all of a sudden, Moses, led by God, lifts up his staff, right? And in that moment, that sea that seemed like a wall parts and they are delivered right through it. And right after Moses lowers it, that thing comes crashing down and destroys all of God's enemies. Because we worship a God, when he strikes, he divides and he delivers 
And as that court closes its doors, it will come crashing down and one day cease to exist. But I'll tell you who made it out of there safely. The Apostle Paul, who saw, lifted his hands, and God extracted him from danger. God is a God who can divide. Did you know that? Now, in the church, we pray for unity, and I long for unity in the church. John 17, we want to see the church united. But there are a lot of evil alliances in the world. Did you know that? One of our prayers should be that God would divide them because when unholy alliances form, they can do great harm. And God is a God that can scatter and divide these so that good will prevail. God is a God who struck Satan on the cross, right? He struck Jesus' as heel, but Jesus then crushed and struck his head so that the forces of evil would be divided. And we as a church and we as believers, we pray for unity in the truth. But we pray for God to divide and scatter any evil purposes in the world for the deliverance of his people and for the glory of his name. Amen? We worship a God who strikes to divide and deliver. I love that song. We're going to sing it towards the end of our service today. No longer slaves. I'll put the lyrics on the screen. It says, you unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. We worship a God who strikes to divide and to deliver. So first, he brings down walls. Second, he divides and he delivers. Thirdly and finally, when God strikes, he stands by to encourage. He stands by to encourage, verse 11. Well, the following night, the Lord stood by him. Who? Stood by Paul. The following night, he came to Paul and said this, listen, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, that's where he is right now, so you must testify also in Rome. When God strikes, he stands by to encourage. If you've been with us for a while, you know that Paul always saw Jerusalem and Rome as his final two destinations, and Jesus comes back as he is extracted from this court that is about to rip him limb from limb. He's taken back to the barracks. That's the Roman barracks, probably locked up in a prison underground. And in darkness and loneliness with the cell firmly shut behind him, the door locked, who shows up but none other than the Lord Jesus himself. And in that place of solitude, Paul realizes that he is not alone. And I don't think this is just spiritually Jesus speaking to Paul's heart or in his ears. I think if that was the case, Luke would have wrote, the Holy Spirit spoke to him, you know, those sort of things. When the Lord shows up, he has a vision of Jesus where Jesus comes to him and explicitly says to him, take courage. For as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. The final strike we see in here is not a strike of judgment, but the reality that when God strikes, when God shows up, he shows up not only with his power, but God shows up with his very own personal presence. He comes into this place of solitude and loneliness, in this place of uncertainty, in this place of danger, in this place of fear. And he speaks to Paul, he speaks to him as a son, as an apostle, and says, take courage, you will make it to Rome. I think of Joshua as he's about to enter the promised land. And remember, time and time again, he's told this, be strong, be strong and courageous. But don't be strong in your strength, right? Don't be courageous because you're brave. Be strong and courageous for why? For the Lord your God is with you. 
And when Jesus commissioned us, he commissioned the church after he rose from the dead. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. For behold, I am with you. I am with you, I am with you, I am with you to the very end of the age. The age is not over yet, did you know that? The age is still going on. So Jesus is still with you. So you can be strong, you can be encouraged, you can be courageous because Jesus meets you not only with his promises, not only with his power, but Jesus meets you with himself. Jesus, when he strikes, when he comes into our life, he comes into our life. Say that again. When Jesus comes into your life, he comes into your life. You have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer you who live. Christ lives in you. Jesus is with you in the hard times, in the fiery furnace, if you will. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would not bow to the golden image in Babylon. You remember that. Please say yes. And so they are thrown into a fiery furnace that is amped up seven times its normal heat. Literally, the people throwing them in are dying from the heat. But in the furnace, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, looks, and he sees them not consumed because there is not just one, two, three men walking around, but he says, I see a fourth man in there like the Son of God. The Son of God is with you in the fiery furnace. The Son of God is with you in the prison cell. The Son of God is with you in the moments of your greatest fears. The Son of God is with you when you are all alone. You are not alone. Christ is with you. When God strikes, he stands by to encourage. Martin Luther, when he cried out that vow, he said, help me, Saint Anne, and I will become a monk. And all of our Protestant (laughs) impulses recoil like, Saint Anne, what are you doing? Why are you calling out to Saint Anne? And not to Jesus. Because St. Anne was the only mediator that he knew. At that point in his life, he was the son of a miner. Like the miners that go into coal mines and collect precious metals. And St. Anne was the patron saint to miners. Likely a statue of St. Anne in the town that he grew up in. In fact, his father was a miner that got so wealthy, he bought a second mine and used his wealth to send his son to law school to become a lawyer. When partway through his studies, he did an about face, made a vow to God and said, I will become a monk. But there in the monastery, as he studied God's word, he found a new mediator. He found somebody that he could call upon. He found a Savior that would be nearer and dearer and closer to him than a brother. And after he went through his theological training and encountered Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ struck him not only through the lightning, but struck his soul, all of a sudden he became a fiery reformer in the church. And he said, there is one mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he nailed his 95 theses against the church door and said, church, we have some cleaning up to do. The world has never been the same, and I promise you 500 years ago, they were not preaching verse by verse like this in their Bibles, but they're doing it now. You know why? Because God struck. God is a God who strikes and brings about complete renewal in the world. And by the way, not only did he reform his theology and reform where he looked for a mediator, But he drove away his fears. You remember that Martin Luther was a slave to fear. But he realized that he was now a child of God. That he was fully accepted by God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That there was a new high priest that he could turn to. And that the meteor that he needed was not the statue in the town he grew up. 
but the Lord Jesus ascended in heaven who stood on his behalf. Wherever you are this morning, may the strike of God find you. May he tear down any false walls in your life, in your own soul. May he divide and deliver you through any trial that you're walking through. And may he be the God of all courage, comfort, and hope to be present with you in your time of loneliness and fear to drive it away. Amen? Amen. Let's stand, church. Before we close with the song of worship, I'm going to bow our heads in prayer. If there are any here this morning who would like to place your faith in Jesus Christ, you hear this message and you hear that Jesus is the great high priest, that means he represents you before God. You hear that he died for you, that he paid for all of your sin, including hypocrisy. He pays for it all. He's a great deliverer and you haven't received him. You know that he lives inside of those who trust in him, but you haven't done that yet. Before we leave today, I want to give you an opportunity to call on Jesus' name, to cry out to him that he would save you. If you'd like me to pray for you and lead you in a prayer of repentance, just raise your hand so I can see you. I see you. Who else? Anybody else? Pray this. Jesus, just in your heart quietly, thank you for dying for me on the cross. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died and rose again on the third day. I believe that you are the God of all deliverance and that you were struck so that I might be set free. You were struck so that evil might be conquered in my life and in the world. And today I turn to you and place my faith in you find my hope in Christ alone. Forgive me of all my sins and come into my life to stand by me and encourage me through every circumstance. And for the church, God, now as we turn our hearts and our prayers to you and back to worship for one final song, we pray, God, that you would be the God of all comfort, the God of all peace and hope. You would be a God who strikes in our lives at your perfect time and strikes through us to accomplish great things in the world, divide evil in our own souls and in the world, we pray, and unify us around the truth. And Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you are God not only in heaven who looks down, but you are God who intervenes strongly on behalf of your people. Thank you that you are a God who divides the sea so we can walk right through it. May we not be slaves to fear, we are sons and daughters of God on our side. We thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.